welcome to our viewing audience to the Meno Nerds interview with Greg Boyd on his book, The Crucifixion of the Warrior God. Greg is a theologian. He's a drummer, a pastor at Woodland Hills Church in St. Paul's, Minnesota. He's authored over 20 books and numerous academic articles. Some of those books include The Myth of a Christian Nation, The Benefit of the Doubt, Is God to Blame, God at War, The Trinity and Process, and the book that we'll be discussing in length today, The Crucifixion of the Warrior God. Welcome to the podcast, Greg. It's good to be here. Thanks so much. <laughs> well, how about before we get into the, uh, the discussion on the book, let's just take a moment to pray. That'd be great. That'd All be great. Right. So, holy God, we come before you as your servants, and we thank you, Lord, for, for your cross. We thank you, God, that you stretch up out your hands on the hard wood of the cross. And, and Lord, you did it for us, for our salvation. You, you stooped to become, Lord, our salvation. And we pray, Lord, that as we discuss your cross and discuss scripture, that you would be with us and you'd help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, it's great to meet you, Greg, and I have to confess, I feel like I'm talking to an old-time friend because I've been one of those parishioners for many, many years, I think going okay. back to like 2009, and, and so it's, it's kind of it's a bit surreal to be speaking with you now, but I, I, I oh, thanks, uh, but one of the, and in fact, I should introduce myself because I did, I did that our first time, but I haven't introduced myself at all. My name's Paul Walker. I'm a pastor in a small town Mennonite church here in Canada, in Manitoba, about an hour outside Winnipeg for anyone that needs to know. And yeah, I, I read the book and I'm here uh, discussing with Greg uh, on the book. So the first time I heard about this book, Greg, uh, The Crucifixion of the Warrior God, is when uh, a Canadian church brought you in. That Canadian church was... Uh, the meeting house, oh, yeah. pastor by uh, Pastor Boxy Cavey, and they brought you in during a series called the Inglorious Pastors. Inglorious oh yeah, that's Pastors. right. Yeah, I remember that. And it was it was a nonviolent sort of uh, dealing with Jesus's peace teachings, mm -hmm. and in that series, Roxy brought you in to deal just with the topic of how do we deal with Old Testament violence. And I remember back then, I think it was around 2010. You, you gave reference to this book you were working on, and that was 2010. And, <laughs> uh, and you kind of you sketched out some points that later became that showed up in the yeah. book. I, I definitely saw some of those in the book. Um, but that was many years ago. Like since that time, I've been married. I've had two kids since you've been writing <laughs> this book. Like yeah. it's been a long time coming. It's been a big journey. I think the joke is like I, I heard someone on Twitter or Facebook say like, I think Greg will be writing that forever. You know, <laughs> like it was just like, um, but I wanted to ask you the question um, because in your introduction, you, you shared this process of trying to write a very different book. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that to your dismay about 50 pages into the project that you originally planned on dealing with these uh, Old Testament violent depictions that you totally abandoned it and you yeah. took up instead this other project. So I wanted to ask you the question, what led you to, to give up on that original book that you had planned? Well, I, so I, I was, the clearer I got about uh, the nonviolence of Jesus and his revelation of God and stuff, the, the more problematic the Old Testament violent portraits of God became. And not just for me, but for people in my congregation and the pod, pod parishioners. I was constantly getting asked, well, what about, what about, what about? Uh, and, and so I, I finally decided, um, and this is, I think, around 2006 or mm -hmm. 2007, that, that uh, I needed to write, write a book on this. And um, at that point in my life, I was uh, working on the assumption that God actually did this stuff. But uh, uh, I wanted to provide like, a good rationale for it. Like, you know, the best possible reasons, um, give the best possible spin to these things. Kind of like the book I was going to write was like Paul Copen's Is God a Moral Monster? Um, and so I, I started on that. And, and I had collected over the years all these arguments, and I was just going to kind of like distill them all into one little booklet for, for people. But 
they seem persuasive at the time I collected them, but now when I put them to paper, when I, when I, when I collected all of the violent uh, passages, there's over a thousand where God is, commands or uh, engages in violence. And um, when you put them, bring them together, it's quite a, an experience. Um, there's some horrific stuff there. And, and, uh, uh, and then as I tried to explain them, it just fell flat. It was like I could see holes in my arguments. And, and it, it just didn't, I didn't think come close. Uh, to explaining what needed to be explained. But even more seriously, I had come to see that the challenge uh, is not really to make God look a little better, or a little less monstrous, maybe even ethical, as challenging as that is. Uh, in fact, the challenge isn't even to make the God of the Old Testament look Christ-like, as impossible as that is sometimes. The real goal is to show how all Scripture is about Jesus. Jesus says, all Scripture is about me, and more specifically, it's about his sufferings. Uh, in Luke 24. And, and so all scripture is to be, and there's a long church tradition that says this, that all scripture is to be bear, bear witness to uh, Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. Um, and, and so the challenge is to show how does uh, these macabre portraits of God commanding uh, you know, genocide and uh, telling his soldiers you can keep the virgins for war booty and try them out in marriage, but if it doesn't work, you can turn them out on the street and all these things. How, you know, stone children that disobey you and all this, how does that bear witness to the self-sacrificial, nonviolent God who's revealed on the cross? That's the real challenge. And so that set me on a completely different trajectory of research. And uh, 10 years later, I'm here. Yeah. About it. So what would you consider unique about this project that contributed to both the, the length of it? I mean, it's almost 1,400 pages. And also the, just the time it took you to wrestle and write this. Like, was there, what was the uniqueness of this project that? It's so actually a 1,492 pages. That's the official tally on it. <laughs> uh, the, um, well, okay, the, the, the thing is this, is that it, to date, you have got basically two options. You've got those who say, uh, yes, God did command all that violence and did engage in all that violence. And, and so we have to just sort of combine those facts, those pictures of God with the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. And so you end up with a kind of montage uh, picture of God. He's partly loving, but he's also got this dark streak, which has been the traditional view, at least since the fifth century. Then you've got some who really get the nonviolence of Jesus' revelation of God and his kingdom ethic, and, and they conclude that there's no way that Jesus would ever have slaughtered these children and babies and ripped fetuses out of the wombs like Yahweh said to do and caused parents to cannibalize their own children like Yahweh has said to do, and all these other horrible, horrible things. But they solved the problem by saying it didn't happen. Uh, well, you know, they, they dismiss it. Uh, it's not written in history, or they'll give whatever reasons, but they'll say it's not, it's not we don't have to worry about it because it just didn't happen. Uh, no, I, I have trouble with that because it seems to me that Jesus endorsed the whole Old Testament as the word of God. Uh, and, and, and whatever else that means, I feel like I have to take every passage of Scripture seriously. I'm not afraid to dismiss anything. Uh, on the other hand, the, the groups that, that uh, kind of combine the violent portraits of God with, with the revelation of Jesus, I don't think they take serious enough the absoluteness of the revelation as it's presented in the New Testament. Uh, mm -hmm. Jesus isn't just one revelation among others. Uh, he's the revelation that culminates and supersedes all others. Uh, well, let's and, talk about that because you spend basically a first chunk of, like the book comes in two parts. The first part is the cruciform hermeneutic. And then the second part, part two, is your cruciform thesis. And, you know, you kind of in the first, I think about four or five chapters, you spend five on chapters, the yeah. Crucif uh, yeah, yeah, on the cruciform hermeneutic. And basically the foundation of what you're trying to say is you're trying to say that the revelation of God in Christ is not merely the you know, some sort of best revelation among right, others. Right, 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 right. It's the supreme, it's the definitive revelation. Like, Absolutely. you quote Michael Ramsey's is saying, God is Christ-like, and in him is no unchristlikeness at all. And right. you also quote Karl Barth by saying, like, the meaning of God cannot be gathered from any notion of supreme, absolute, non-worldly being. It can only be learned from what took place in Christ. And so I, I think for our viewing audience, like this is, this is so, you know, foundational and you know, yeah, I say, because of this. yeah, I, I say yes and amen. So I, I want you to explain to our viewing audience why it is important to have Christ completely shape our in, image of God and why must the revelation of God in Christ be given interpretive 
priority over all preceding revelations. Yeah, I, I, I really, I argue that, that this is how the New Testament portrays him. Um, and I've got mm. uh, roughly, what, 60, about 200 pages where I first show that uh, the revelation of God in Christ is considered to be the revelation that sums up and culminates and surpasses all others. And then how all of that is centered on the cross. Um, mm. And it's just, you know, it, it's, it's the way that, that Jesus talks and the gospel is all, all oriented around the cross. And he, he's, he's, it's portrayed as the, the summation of the whole story of Israel, the culmination of all that. Um, you know, John says that he's the word. Uh, there's one word, and it's, there's not like a lot of words, and Jesus is one of them. He is mm. the word. And so insofar as anyone's heard a genuine word from God, it's been Jesus Christ. Uh, the author of Hebrews you know, says that in the past, God spoke in various ways, and uh, the Phillips translation says they got glimpses of truth. Um, mm. uh, but in these last days, God's spoken through his own son, uh, who, who is the uh, radiance of God's glory. Uh, they saw glimpses of God's glory, but now Jesus is the very shininess of God's glory, the radiance of his glory. When God shines, it looks like Jesus. And, and uh, they've got approximation of God's character, but the sun, he says, is the exact likeness or the exact representation of God's very essence, hypostasis. The sun reveals what God's like all the way down. And so there's this contrast. You know, insofar as they saw truth, they were seeing Jesus, but they were only getting glimpses. But now we've got the real McCoy. God's come to us in, in his own person. Uh, that's why in John 1, it says that the word became flesh uh, and, and that, well, the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Um, the, the truth is there's an element of untruth that went on before. It was, they got some genuine stuff, but it was mixed up with untruth. But now grace and truth have come through, through, uh, through, through Jesus Christ. That's why he says that no one has seen God at any time, but now the only begotten son, he has declared him. And for John, um, the... Uh, to, the metaphor of seeing is 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 uh, used for knowing, uh, to, and we use it that way too sometimes. Like, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, mm. do, you, do you get it? So we say no one really knew God before, but now the only begotten Son, He has declared Him. Um, Jesus says the same thing in in, in Matthew 11:27 when he, when He says that no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son will reveal Him. And, and there's got to be a little hyperbole here because if you took it literally, uh, you'd be saying you know, no one in the Old Testament knew God at all. Uh, but he, hyperbolically, he's saying it's as though, compared to what the Son reveals about the Father, it's as though no one else knew anything else about God. And, and you have this consistent theme about how Jesus has priority over everything that preceded him. That's why he feels free to uh, sometimes replace Old Testament laws with his own teaching. You've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's found three times in the Old Testament. Uh, but I say unto you, uh, turn the other cheek and love your enemies and bless those who persecute you. And so, uh, the last thing we should ever do is place the revelation of God in Christ, and especially in the crucified Christ, alongside these other revelations, as, as though they had the authority to supplement or qualify uh, what we find in Christ. Uh, rather, we're to consider, like Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. Why then do you ask, show us the Father? Mm. When, when, you, when you get God in, in Jesus Christ, you don't need to go to any other source. And, and, uh, and so we should interpret everything that precedes Jesus through the lens of Jesus, uh, not alongside of Jesus. And that's what we find the New Testament authors doing. You know, they read this Old Testament, and they find stuff that the original authors never would have dreamed of because they're reading it through the, the lens of Christ. Knowing that the story all points in this direction, they look back at it and they find things that, that they otherwise wouldn't find. I, I, everything hangs on that because it's only when we fully trust that God it was only when I came, when I stopped trying to defend the violence, and I just resolved that God really does look, God really is the way he's revealed in the crucified Christ, and I'm going to trust that. Mm -hmm. And it's when I fully trust that God is uh, a self-sacrificial, uh, nonviolent, enemy-embracing, loving God, that that's the final word about God, that now I'll go back and now I was able to start to see something I didn't see before because I held fast to the conviction that, that, that these, all scripture, including these violent portraits of God, must somehow bear witness to that revelation. And, and, and it's only when I stopped justifying the violence, but also when I refused to dismiss it, that I was able to start to see something that, uh, um, that, that mediates between this position of either dismiss it or accept the, 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 the face value of it. And that, by the way, Paul, is 
how it was the dominant way of interpreting these passages in the early church. Uh, in the early church, Origen, Gregory, Anissa, and other church fathers, they didn't feel free to dismiss anything in Scripture, uh, but they also didn't feel like they could accept the, the, the surface meaning of these violent portraits because they said they're unworthy of God. They conflict with what we learn about God and Jesus Christ. And, and, and so what they did is they reinterpreted them. As they, they read all this, these passages through the lens of the cross, they found Christ-centered meanings in them. Mm-hmm. And, and all I'm trying to do in this work, really, is to pick up that tradition and, uh, uh, and, and offer it to those who, like me, embrace the full inspiration of the entire Bible, and yet we believe that God is altogether nonviolent. There is a way of doing that. Do you think it would be fair to say that, like, those that, that view sort of a flat Bible where, where we just sort of synthesize every, every uh, depiction of God together with the revelation of Christ, would it be fair to say that not only do they have a flat reading of Scripture, but it would seem they have a low Christology? Yeah, I, I totally think that they are doing Christ a major disservice. Um, we're not properly honoring him when we put him alongside everything else. And, and, mm-hmm. and it, it will sound like we're honoring him because we say, oh, he, he's the greatest. He, he is the fullest revelation. You know, we see God most perfectly here. Uh, but if you're still allowing, you know, that there's this genocidal part of God, this part of God that could, you know, uh, just uh, say it's okay to ins- take women as, as sexual slaves, as war booty. Uh, it, it, well, then that's going to qualify what you learn about God in, in mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Uh, the analogy I use in the book is, is like this. Uh, it, it, suppose that I'm, I, I'm walking downtown on a random day and I see my wife on the other side of the street. And I, I, I call out to her, but she can't hear me because there's too much traffic and I can't cross the street to get to her. So I just sort of finally observe her. And she's coming upon this panhandler. And I know my wife. I've been married to her for 37 years. And, and she's a gracious, kind, loving woman, you know, as kind as any person you'll ever meet. And so I'm expecting she's going to empty her wallet out in this guy's can. Uh, but imagine instead I see her, you know, just slap the guy and, and, and knock the jar out of his hand and take his cap and start running. Well, I'd be shocked. Right, I, 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 I'd be appalled by this, but now I have a decision to make. I could suppose that maybe uh, my wife, after 37 years, you know, I, you think you know somebody, but it turns out she's got this vicious, wicked, cruel streak in her, uh, and she's been hiding it from me. Uh, I could, I could think that, but see, that feels dishonoring to to my wife and to our marriage. It calls into question the authenticity of our marriage. I can't go there. So if I can't go there, I I have to believe that something else was going on. And now I'll just try to imagine a scenario that would make sense out of this. Maybe she was co-opted into a sociological experiment, or maybe uh, she's part of a street skit, or maybe she's joined a reality TV show, and, 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 and you know, they're capturing the horrified looks on people's faces. Or maybe I'm being punked, and this is you know, a reality TV show where the joke's on me. Uh, those makes all seem improbable, but they all become very plausible once I shut the door on the possibility that my wife could actually be that cruel. If, if, if I shut the door on the possibility that God could actually be as bloodthirsty as he's depicted in the Old Testament, yet I'm not going to deny that I did see my wife. Now I am in a position where I'll entertain possible scenarios that I otherwise wouldn't entertain. Um, and, and, uh, and that's where I have to assume something else was going on. And that's something else. When I find it, it will point me, it will show me how these violent portraits of God bear witness to the nonviolent loving God is revealed on, on Calvary. Uh, that's the analogy of the situation I think we're in. That's, that's really great. Um, so sort of riffing off that a bit, I wonder if you might comment, uh, you talk about a bit in the book about uh, commenting uh, about the author of Hebrews and Colossians about this language of shadow and reality. I imagine um, that might be helpful for some of our viewers. Yeah, and he, both in Hebrews and in Colossians, they use this metaphor of shadow and reality. Uh, the reality is Christ and, and the law or the temple, or, you know, and they're just kind of basically referring to the, the gist of the Old Testament. It's a shadow, and the shadow is there to point to the reality. Um, and now the thing is this, is that if you mistake the shadow for reality, you know, the shadow will never point you to the reality. You know, if you if I see a shadow, but I don't see of a tree, but I don't see the tree. Well, if I follow the shadow, I'll bump into the tree. But if I mistake the shadow for a real tree, sort of like the people in Plato's cave, you know, mm. uh, um, then then I'll just I, 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 it won't point anywhere. I'll just think, oh, this is this is what trees are like. Uh, once I know that it's a shadow, I can tell some things about a tree by looking at it. 
you know, I can tell the basic outline of the tree and, you know, just things like that. But I, I, the reality of the tree greatly outruns the shadow. It's got three dimensions. It's got color. It's got smell. It's got all those things. So also, the, old, the purpose of the Old Testament is to lead us to Christ. Uh, it is a shadow that is, is to lead us to the reality. But if we forget that it's a shadow and start treating it as the reality, well, now, well, now it's not going to point to Christ at all. Uh, the violent portraits of God are just violent. And, and now, now we have two trees. <laughs> there's the violent God and, and there's the, 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 the self-sacrificial God. And this is what gives rise to all of our incoherent theology and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. so I think it's always important. to It's, it's just an analogy, but it's, it's important to remember that you're not dealing with reality, the full reality back then. Something else is going on. And that something else points to the cross. Good. I, I imagine, and we'll talk about the cross in just a second, because that really builds a big case in the book. But um, I'd like to take a moment just to establish uh, what we see when we see Christ. And when we look at the life, uh, ministry, death, resurrection, especially on this topic of violence, of enemy love, um, we had a question come in um, that, that a viewer, they were basically following you on, okay, yes, I can see the revelation of God in Christ. But now the question is sort of, now, nah, why is that? Why is that a contradiction to, to the violent depictions? In fact, this one uh, YouTube comment um that that has come in is said well what about jesus in revelation 19 with the sword sure um, so maybe uh comment comment briefly to our viewing audience how how jesus is uh how he teaches us to to be enemy loving and reveals god as the lover of enemies sure okay we're very good very good yeah yeah um well you know what i argue in two chapters in crucifixion of the warrior god is is i just show all the areas in which jesus has this cru this cruciform motif the cross i i i don't think, think the cross is should be understood apart from the life of jesus it rather the, it, it's the thematic summary of everything jesus was about mm -hmm. uh, there's a long Protestant tradition of sort of isolating the atonement for the to, for the cr cross as though his death could be understood apart from his life but I, I i see it as a thematic whole and there's a number of other scholars who who join me in that and so you know, throughout his teachings in various ways, uh, he, he's talking about self-sacrificial love. The last shall be first. You know, the greater is he that serves than the he, he that is served. And, and, and uh, you know, so pouring your life out for others. And he models that. Um, and then, you know, he teaches things like this. Uh, the, the most clear teaching is when he, he refutes the Old Testament lex telionis, the law of just ret retribution, which is uh, found three times in the Old Testament. And he says, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you now to turn the other cheek and love your enemies and bless those who persecute you and pray for those who despitefully use you. Do good to those who are, 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 treat you cruelly uh, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Now, I, I, I had read the Bible so many times before I actually noticed that about 15 years ago, that this is his criteria for being considered a child of the Father in heaven, uh, that you're able to not retaliate, um, that you not resort to violence. Uh, not respond in kind, but instead you repay evil with good, as Paul says in Romans 12. And, and, uh, uh, and this is the criteria for being considered a child of the Father in heaven. And then he goes on to, to, add, to explain. He goes, for the Father, he causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, and the righteous and the wicked. Uh, in other words, this is how the Father loves. He loves indiscriminately. The, the sun doesn't pick and choose who it's going to shine on. It just does it. And the rain doesn't pick and choose who it's going to get wet. It just, it just falls on people. So also God's love is indiscriminate. And then he says, so let your, so you be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. But he's talking about the perfection of this kind of love, um, a love that is not, not discriminating. And so it's based, we, we reflect that we're children of the Father when our, our character aligns with his character. And his character is unconditionally loving, even of enemies, and refuses to engage in violence. And so when we put on this way that character, uh, then we do the same. And this is what the cross reveals. Um, he, Jesus could have called legions of angels. He had resources to crush his enemies, but instead he chose to, uh, uh, to, to love his enemies and die at the hands of his enemies because that's what his enemies needed. Um, and then he prays for the forgiveness of his enemies with his last you know, dying breath. Uh, and this is an example that we're called to follow yeah, in, in First Peter. This is not just something he does for us. This is an example of words called to follow. It's all based on the character of God. So this is a God who would rather uh, be killed by enemies rather than to kill his enemies. 
Uh, it's the, the radical, cruciform uh, nature of God. And the resurrection, everything about Jesus' life, leading up to it and following it, points to that. The, the cross is simply the victory of that cruciform love, that self-sacrificial love, where he gives his life for his enemies, because that's what his enemies need. Um, and so, yeah, they, I, 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 on that basis, I see God as altogether, uh, cr to, to rephrase Ramsey's quote that you started with earlier, uh, God is cross God is cross-like love, and in him there is no non-cross-like thing. Mm. And this is what you know, John says, can, he sum, summarizes the, the revelation of God in Christ by saying, God is love, 1 John 4, 8. And then he defines love by pointing us to the cross. Here's what we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's the criteria. Mm. And that's so important because we have a long theological tradition, going back to St. Augustine, uh, where we'll say, yes, God is love. But now we'll make love mean whatever the hell we want it to mean. You know, God's love. But that doesn't mean he doesn't predestine the majority of people to go to hell. Uh, God is love, but he still can predestine every nasty thing in history. And That's so an word, important clarification that love itself, agape love, takes its shape from the cross itself. Exactly. It, exactly. It's, not, it's not a nebulous sort of love. It's, it, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know, Augustine thought, said that, um, that you know, love uh, is a, uh, an inward disposition that does not necessarily have uh, any behavioral consequences, which is why he, he actually argued you can torture a, a heretic and still love that heretic. Trouble is that uh, uh, Jesus specifies uh, that we should not only love our enemies, but do good to those who persecute you and pray for them. It has behavioral consequences, and the cross certainly had behavioral consequences for Jesus. Uh, it wasn't just an attitude. No, he actually did something on behalf uh, of, of, of his enemies. And so we, uh, it, we have a very objective definition of the kind of love that God is. God is mm -hmm. cross-like love all the way down. And, uh, and so we need to read all of Scripture through, through that lens. Now, you know, folks, so there's a long tradition, again, going back to Augustine, of, of not wanting to see that. Because if you see that, it has tremendous implications for your life and for the church. And you might have trouble running this state and, and you know, protecting the state against enemies if you take this seriously. So we need to find ways of, of, of marginalizing that teaching. And the, we've had the best minds in Christendom have been employed to find ways around this, this, this rock of Gibraltar, this Magna Carta that, of, of, of Jesus' whole ministry and revelation of God. And, and in that, among those ways around is you try to find things in Jesus' life that you can sort of use to then leap over him and grab onto the violent pictures of God to justify the violence you want to get into. This is what began to happen in the 4th and 5th century. So, you know, Jesus cleansed the temple and he got mad. Uh, I've actually read books where they have argued, uh, well, look, if Jesus got mad in the temple, why would we balk at him, you know, commanding to, his people to show no mercy and slaughter everything that breathes, as though there's no gap between those two things. Mm. Um, Turning over a table and, and just driving out animals. I mean, well, see, that's it. It, it, yeah. it never says he, yeah. he cracked a whip to cause an animal stampede. John two. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it never says he used it on people or or it was you know even used it on animals. He just he just caused a stampede. In Revelation, I just for folks who are hung up on that, I have a whole appendix on that in volume one, um, and I, and I'll just say that here's a classic thing where it, it, if. Now, the book of Revelation, if you read it expecting to find a violent Jesus, you'll find a violent Jesus, a horrifically violent Jesus. Uh, but if you read it knowing what God, in some ways, it's, it, we need to do the Revelation, what I'm doing with the Old Testament. Um, if you trust that God really does look like the, the crucified Christ, uh, then when you read the Revelation from that perspective, you will notice some things that you otherwise may not notice. Uh, and it becomes, just like the Old Testament violent uh, uh, portraits of God, become these literary crosses that magnificently put on display the mercy and love of God once you read them through the lens of the cross. So also the book of Revelation, once you start reading it through the lens of the cross, you will find some beautiful stuff there. So, you know, what John does. A, yeah, I have a friend that, that likes to comment uh, that, that the whole cipher of the book of Revelation is uh, Revelation chapter 5, where, where John is told, look, the Lion of Judah. Yep. Yep. And then he looks, and what does he see? The lamb slain, the lamb right. slaughtered before and, the foundation. And John of the world. does that John, throughout, mm -hmm. throughout that book. He'll take a violent, a traditional violent image, and he'll completely subvert it and turn it on its head, its head to mean the opposite uh, by combining it with 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 a, a new image. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Richard Baucom is brilliant on this. If you read his 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 work on Revelation, uh, he, that's where I learned some of this stuff. Was 
uh, just how John massively subverts this. And, and yeah, Jesus goes to battle, but he goes to battle, you know, covered in blood. Uh, he takes an image out of Isaiah uh, 61, I think it is, or maybe 63, uh, where the Yahweh is this warrior covered in blood. And it's a traditional warrior God image, but the blood he's covered in is the blood of his enemies because he's coming back from battle. And it's like a badge of honor. You know, I got their blood on me, but they don't have my blood on them. But John takes that and, and he beautifully subverts it because Jesus is covered in blood before he even goes into battle. Uh, my and favorite question to ask about that passage is that usually when, when congregants ask me, like, clearly Jesus is being violent. I, my favorite question to ask is, where's the sword? Well, coming out of his mouth. <laughs> coming out of his mouth, exactly, right. And yeah. we, tend to, we tend to always have it in his hand, right? I've yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's... Um, it's uh, those depictions. Yeah, I, right. And what does it look like when God speaks? Well, I, I'd like to point out that if God speaks the creation into existence through nonviolence, if God refounds the world and the cross by nonviolence, then clearly the culmination of the age to come is also through nonviolence. Right, like yeah. at no you point do you see the pattern. Yeah, you think yeah, that'd yeah. be the pattern? We'll see about that. So, anyways, so, yeah, yeah. So the, the it, it's yeah. and I'd argue that way for all the rather silly arguments that people use to try to you know like Jesus said, go out and buy two swords. Yeah, you know, well, just just look at it in context. Uh, if you really want, look what happened when Pete, when Peter tried to use a sword. You know, he rebukes him, and and if you're going to take on the Roman guard, and you need a lot more than two swords. Yeah, but, but Jesus explicitly says there in, in Luke 22, he says, I, I'm telling you this because uh, the Son of Man must be accounted among the transgressors. So he's fulfilling this prophecy, but also then really giving the, 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 his, his opponents reason to arrest him. He must be counted. He has to play the part of an insurrectionist. So he needs two swords to do that, but he never intended them to use it. Yeah. Mm, exactly. Well, let's let's move on to the cross as the central revelation of Jesus's life, ministry, everything um, that 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 Christ does. In fact, in chapters four and five of the book, you you're building on the work of Torrance, uh, Thomas Torrance, uh, Bart of Luther, Balthazar, and you really you see the cross not so much just even Jesus shaped hermeneutic, but a cross shaped hermeneutic, a cruciform. Yeah. Hermeneutic. I wonder if you could explain that to our viewing audience, why the cross must be the central thematic and culminating expression of everything from the incarnation to the ascension. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, again, I've got over 120 pages on this. It's, uh, it's hard to summarize. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just say a word about it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, it, in various ways, the whole Old Testament, uh, I mean, Old, New Testament, is, is pointing us back to the, the cross as the central revelation of Jesus. Uh, the Gospels, you know, Martin Kaler described as, as passion narratives with, with extended introductions. Uh, they're all oriented towards the, the cross. It's, it's the, from the very start, it's the center. Uh, John's always talking about the hour in which the Father will be glorified. Um, in John 12, you know, he, he talks about his hours come, and he would love to avoid this fate. But he says, nevertheless, you know, it's for this reason that I came into the world. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when I'm lifted up, I'll draw amen to me. But he was, John specifies there, he's speaking about his death. Uh, and so, the, of course, Jesus always glorifies the Father. Uh, when he says, if you see me, you see the Father in John 14, that's true of every period of his life. But the cross in particular puts on display the, the, the magnificence of, of God, the shininess of his love. Uh, John, in, in, in Paul, you just see the cross permeates everything. Uh, even, you know, the, the incarnation uh, in Philippians 2. You know, yeah, the son sets aside all of his benefits to become a, uh, this human being. But then he takes on a form of a servant and is obedient even unto death, death by the cross. And so the cross here is the, is, is the summation of the incarnation. And that's for that reason then that God has exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. Uh, you know, for Paul... Um, he, he, he virtually equates the gospel with the message of the cross. He uses those terms interchangeably. Uh, to, to the message of the cross is the gospel, which shows you how central you know, that is for him. That's why he could say to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, uh, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, uh, I've resolved to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. And that statement presupposes that uh, Paul doesn't need to know one other thing in the universe other than Jesus Christ and him crucified for him to preach the gospel to these people. Uh, that, that summarizes the whole thing. 
And so in a lot of different ways, you find the centrality, you know, just come back to again and again and again. Um, and, and so I, I, I argue that, that, that the, the cross simply is the thematic center of everything Jesus was about. And you can trace this thread, you know, uh, in, in a lot of different ways, through his teaching, through his ministry. Uh, everything he does in his life, it, it anticipates uh, what is, in a definitive way, accomplished on the cross. So, for example, the way he enters into solidarity with the, the, the lost, uh, the beggars, the outcasts, the marginalized, the unclean. You know, the way he, he just breaks all those religious taboos to be in solidarity with those folks. Uh, that is a, a, a harbinger of, of how he enters into solidarity with the sin of the world on the cross. And, and the way that he violates the, the kind of the ethnic lines of his day. Uh, praising the Samaritans and and treating women with with uh, you know re respect, crossing gender uh, uh, lines and and uh, holding up you know Roman centurion as you know this the hero of the faith, that is anticipating kind of what he does on the cross when he unites all when, when he creates one new humanity. Paul says in Ephesians two and um, uh, tears down every dividing wall of hostility. So his life is an anticipation of what's culminated in the cross. Uh, and so when I say that everything bears witness to the cross. I'm not referring to the cross as opposed to everything else in his life. Mm -hmm. I'm referring to the cross as the culmination and the summation of everything else in his life. Uh, it, his whole life is cruciform, and his whole life reveals the cruciform God. Yeah, I think Barth uh, had a similar comment. Um, he said that the cross is the incarnation on, on display. It reveals what was always taking place mm -hmm. in the incarnation, right? The cross becomes that sort of... Uh, paired that axiom like it, it's that sort of decisive moment which that which we can say yeah there it is right there yeah yeah I, I, you find this in Torrance as you mentioned but mm -hmm. Moltmann's really good on this Jungle uh, God is the mystery of the world there's a number of authors who really do get this uh, it's just that none of them then take it a step further and apply it to the interpretation of the violent portraits of God in the Old Testament but uh, they get that 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 centrality is there. And, yeah. and, and the reason why this is so important, Paul, is, I mean, among other things, but in some ways, like, you know, we've talked about people who have a flat reading of the Bible, mm -hmm. where everything is just kind of on the same plane. Um, well, you have the same thing with Christology. You have a flat reading of Jesus. And what I found is, you know, it's kind of in vogue the last 50 years to be Christocentric, especially the last couple decades. Um, and and that, that owes a lot to Karl Barth. Uh, people mm -hmm. have really gotten that that we're not supposed to have a flat Bible. We need to be Christocentric, and so you've got all these books, in Christocentric interpretations, Christocentric theology, Christocentric you know preaching, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, what I found is I've read too many of those Christocentric books, uh, but that for a good portion of them, it's not clear how they'd be different if they weren't Christocentric. Mm. Like what is distinctly point, yeah. Christocentric about this? And, and, you know, the church has always claimed to be tr Christocentric. Uh, throughout its, its it, it interpretive, tr it, we've always known that we should interpret the Bible through the lens of Christ. But uh, it, it's like a, a hermeneutical principle with no teeth. It, it's a little bit like Augustine's, you know, he, he had a principle of love, a, a her hermeneutic of love, uh, where, um, you know, he, he says, we, everything that we read uh, uh, in, in Scripture has to be consistent with the love of God. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, is that it doesn't have any teeth. Because uh, it, it's too amorphic. And, and with Jesus' life, uh, depending on where you want to start and make your centerpiece, you can use that to justify anything you want. And so, as I mentioned, if you start with the temple cleansing and give it the right kind of spin and give it the worst possible reading, well, maybe you can use that so now you can justify God commanding genocide in the Old Testament. Mm. Um, and so Christocentric isn't specific enough. Uh, yeah. but, but that's where it's... That's where I think we need to notice that John says that God is love, and he doesn't leave it up in the ethereal air. He defines love by pointing us to the cross. First John three sixteen. Uh, uh, here's how we know love is: Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. Now, so if the cross is not, so I would argue is that there's a center to Jesus' ministry, uh, and and that is the cross. And so now we need to interpret everything about Jesus' life through the, through that lens because it's all pointing to Him. And then we need to interpret all of Scripture as pointing to that epicenter, that, that, that thematic center of Jesus' life. And that's when you start to get some real clarity on things. And that's a hermeneutic that's got teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, it, whatever's Amen. not consistent with cruciform love, well, now you've got to do some, some thinking. Hey, everyone. This is Paul Walker. 
If you like what you just heard, be sure to check out more of what we have to offer at mentalnerds.com. It's the hub for all things mental nerds. From there, you can learn more about these podcasts, syndicated blogs from people all over the world, books authored by some of our members, and a host of other exciting free resources for you and your church. Now, there's one last thing. Uh, What we do costs a bit of money, and we're always doing it on a volunteer basis. We have people that are committed to making this happen, but we could use more people. If you like what we do, please consider donating monthly. We have two options. You can either do a monthly donation through Patreon, or you can give a one-time donation at any time through PayPal. We love the work we do, but we do need your help to keep it going and to expand into new territory. If you would like to donate, check out menonerds.com slash donate. Thanks for listening, and as always, have a great day.